everyone. Uh, welcome to the Integrative Research Seminar. Uh, it, it is my pleasure to, to introduce the, the speaker today, who, as you all know, is Oscar Camara. Um, Oscar has a degree, an engineering degree in telecommunications from UPC here in Barcelona, and then master's and PhD uh, done in Telecom Paris. Um, he was working as a postdoctoral fellow for um, several years in the UK, first in King's College London and then in University College London. And at some point he came back as a Ramon Cajal fellow already in this department and then later on as associate professor and since recently as full professor also. Um, he has done uh, a number of uh, things since she's here. <laughs> Uh, like, for example, being one of the main driving forces in creating the degree of biomedical engineering and also the master's in computational biomedical engineering. Um, he's also co-founder of a spin-off called MyWendo. And, uh, well, just to mention also that recently he did a one-year stay in New Zealand and maybe he will show some funky pictures. I don't know. So, all yours. <laughs> Chris, Ooh. okay. So thank you for being here, and it's really a pleasure to, uh, in the end, uh, being able to give a seminar, one of these integrative uh, research seminars in the department. That I think it was a very good idea from the beginning, and and I'm going to 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 focus really on the integrative uh, part, um, and and that's why I entitled um, the. Uh, the seminar as integration, multidisciplinarity, and open science in biomedical engineering, because all these terms are quite uh, related into it. And, and in fact, I, I wanted to find out a bit more about um, what really uh, integration uh, means. And, and in fact, looking at the, uh, well, some uh, etymology dictionaries, uh, it says something like, is the act of bringing together the parts of a whole uh, that's quite interesting, and, and also uh, some parts, meaning some exceptions like renewal and restoration, uh, like may hold, renew, begin again. Um, so, I mean, when you find, try to find pictures and images on the web about these renew things, you will start coming with quite uh, fancy quotes and, and the phoenix bird and, and being bored again and, and all this. Um, but the interesting thing is how it links with uh, biomedical engineering. When you look at the formal definition given by the National Institute of Health in, in the US, really it appears the word integration, uh, integrate. And it integrates different uh, disciplines uh, like physics, like chemistry, mathematics, and computational science and engineering. Uh, obviously, with, uh, in problems, related to biology and medicine. Uh, and you see already quite clear uh, the link between integration and multidisciplinarity, and also in particular in biomedical engineering. And, and in, in the projects related to biomedical engineering, uh, mostly uh, kind of these three different uh, animals uh, appear in these projects uh, uh, in terms of engineers, uh, biologists, and, and clinicians. And the patient is really in, in the center. And the relation between all these uh, participants is not always uh, straightforward. And, and in fact, uh, even within the community of biomedical engineering, this has always kind of a, a historical an awareness of the different disciplines, kind of uh, a fight and, and lack of communication between the biologists and medicine and even in, in engineering, different subdisciplines like in data science or, or uh, data processing, uh, um, not really linking all the time with biophysical modelers. And in fact, you can find uh, uh, sometimes kind of experimentalists or observationalists uh, saying things like, oh, uh, we trust the data and, and models are not right, they are not realistic, so we need to believe all, 
only in, in the data. So really that data-centric um, ground truth. And on the other hand, you have the modelers, uh, the opposite uh, thinking, like we trust the model, the, the, the data is wrong because of, of the experiment uh, accuracies and, and lack of reproducibility. So this has been uh, kind of a, a problem that fortunately during the last kind of decade, these things uh, are changing and more and more projects involving both kind of data and models are uh, working uh, together. That's why, I mean, one uh, of the, my main goals in my whole career has been always trying to, to, to make uh, links between uh, different disciplines already uh, in engineering. Uh, so I've been working uh, on trying to really find uh, projects combining data analysis and modeling. Most of the times to try to improve these data processing techniques um, uh, and validate the realism of the computational simulations. Um, and also working with patient-specific data. Also, uh, the thing is that we have been working a lot or, on trying to bring uh, these tools to clinicians, working on the clinical translation, so that these tools are effectively used in a clinical environment. And this for different applications in terms of improving our understanding of the uh, human uh, models and organs, and, and looking also uh, at the whole human body in a holistic way, in a, an integrated way. Um, obviously to try to help clinicians to uh, support their clinical decision making. And, and in fact, uh, I prepared this kind of uh, image a uh, long time ago, uh, just to see, uh, I mean, the combination of, of the different uh, disciplines and fields have been working in terms of neurology and cardiology, and in terms of methodologies, as I've said, uh, from physiological models to data processing. But to be honest, this should be a bit more like this, because I've been working a lot uh, on different projects related to oncology, uh, in the, uh, involving data from the abdomen and, and, and the thorax. And even lately, I should update this uh, with the Miwendo uh, device we have, uh, we have created, uh, something more related to the back of the body. Uh, and so this is kind of uh, an overview based on the Vitruvian Man uh, picture of Leonardo da Vinci of, of, that represents well the large variety of, of applications that have been involved uh, during all these last years. And, and in fact, um, the question is if this lack of a specialization um, is positive or not. Uh, and this is not obvious to answer. Um, in fact, yesterday there was a, an interview uh, in Elsevier because there has been a new open, um, open access multidisciplinary journal created, Brain Multiphysics, and, and Professor Alan Gollery from, uh, Gorelli from Oxford is one of the, um, the, the editors in chief. And, and it was very interesting, the quote, because it's really related. Uh, at some point in the interview, he was saying that, I mean, this, the, the, the balancing the benefits of multidisciplinary research is not that obvious. Uh, I mean, it can be really difficult. And, and in fact, it can be intellectually very interesting. Um, but, I mean, the current situation of funding, career advancements, promotion, and hiring, I mean, is really disciplinary not multidisciplinarity. Uh, and this is a problem. And, and in fact, uh, I mean, it's, I mean, he's a very smart guy, and, and he was saying like, I mean, as a piece of advice, uh, you need to be careful to recommend this to everyone, uh, because it makes things a little harder uh, in a lot of different um, uh, points. Uh, in fact, it means that you need to get out of your comfort zone quite often, you need to, uh, have continuous learning uh, from almost scratch. You feel very often very stupid uh, comparing with uh, the people that are expert in a given uh, domain. It's difficult to reach super grandmaster level uh, in all these disciplines in parallel. And, and in fact, as uh, Alain was saying, I mean, the current situation in projects and fellowships uh, for applications is not obvious to work on multidisciplinarity. And also, 
there are difficulties of communication, talking with a lot of people with different languages. As I say to, to the undergraduate students, you need to face that some people will tell you, you as a biomedical engineer, you are nothing. You are not a biologist, you are not a pure engineer, you are not a pure mathematician, no, not a biologist. So what are you? Um, and this is reality. Even at the tick, we need, uh, as biomedical engineers, we need to fight uh, every day to really convince people from other disciplines that we are engineers, that uh, the methodologies we are applying are as valid, as complex, as mathematical, that any other field. Uh, and quite often, this is not obvious. Um, switching to open science, oops, sorry. Just too large, too heavy presentation. Um, so in terms of open science, um, I mean, we are in, in a department uh, with uh, some groups uh, being really uh, promoting open science and reproducibility, reproducibility research for a long time, like the MTG, with really nice projects like the Free Sound, and also within the Maria de Maetu uh, program is one. It was one of the main transversal uh, actions to to foster uh, reproducible uh, research. So there is a really nice uh, website uh, there uh, at the TIG and, and Maria de Maetu with a lot of. Uh, resources on, on this. Um, in terms of uh, biophysical modeling, uh, historically there has been uh, several groups, in particular uh, the one in, in Oakland, in New Zealand, the Oakland Bioengineering Institute, under the lead of Peter Hunter, that for more than three decades they've been uh, producing tools uh, that, e I mean, everyone working uh, on modeling, in particular in cardiac modeling, are using like this cell ML. Uh, and a lot of different tools where they have models curated uh, and, uh, and that's helping thousands of researchers worldwide. They are involved in a lot of initiatives like the Center for Reproducible Biomedical uh, Modeling in, in the US. They have recently created a Physiom journal where uh, you can, well, you need to uh, upload your code and your models to be created. Uh, so all these initiatives are very important. In terms of neuroimaging, uh, more on the data, medical data science uh, part, also there has been some pioneers, in particular in neuroimaging, not so much in other uh, disciplines like cardiology. People like um, Carl Friston uh, in the 90s, uh, the guy was really taking a plane with a whatever a biometric tape is, uh, and bringing his software, uh, this uh, statistical parameter uh, mapping software, that nowadays is used by everyone working in neuroimaging, including neurologists. And getting on the airplane, going to a given site, install it, and then taking the plane back. And it was thanks to the vision of, of these people that, uh, I mean, they, they, they frame the, the philosophy in your imaging. And all these tools, I mean, free surfer, brain visa, etc. they are open source. And they are used daily in clinical routine. Uh, and that's super important. Also in terms of data access, there has been really large initiatives, in particular in the US, like the ADNI for Alzheimer disease, with thousands of cases that everyone working on Alzheimer disease are using uh, and obviously with a massive visibility and having a huge impact uh, in science. Uh, also, in other fields uh, of data processing, uh, it was in 2007 that they started uh, the organization of these kind of biomedical challenges, uh, in particular in the MICAI conference. And, and, and in fact, it was very interesting last year, or yeah, two years ago, that there was some group from Germany that they analyzed these challenges. Basically, some uh, research group gathered a lot of medical data with ground truth, and then they put it available asking a given question. And then uh, there are participants uh, from other research groups that try to answer these questions with the algorithms. Then at the conference, they put together all the results and they set up a ranking. So by analyzing, uh, analyzing one 
uh, more than 150 of these challenges, still there were a lot of problems of reproduction, uh, of reproducibility, or on try to uh, an adequate interpretation, find the right metrics to evaluate the different algorithms, and also the ranking. Uh, it's tricky because no one wants to be a loser. And uh, with most of these challenges, there is always one winner, which is not really uh, close to the reality. Uh, and in fact, um, this relation between uh, open source, open access data, is it the same as being uh, reproducible? Uh, so it's not really. Uh, and in fact, there is a really nice seminar in the website of Maria Maetsu at the TIC uh, that it's, I really recommend you to, to have a look at. And, and it's just this guy, uh, Sertan Sertuk, that, that exposed his experience related to open access and, uh, and reproducibility. And in fact, he learned very, very interesting things like uh, at some point, he was thinking, trying to reproduce his results, that he was wasting his time. Uh, and in fact, it wasn't really funny at all, trying to reproduce the results again. And, and in fact, uh, just asking someone to reproduce your results is very, very tricky. It's not simple. It needs a lot of effort. Uh, but, but the first person to benefit because of uh, visibility and credibility is the author of, of the of the, of the method. Uh, so, I mean, I guess that, I mean, if I ask you, see if there is anyone against open science and reproducible research, I mean, no one is going to answer no, right? So then why is not that <laughs> widespread? I mean, this was a, a tweet from Alfonso Valencia from Barcelona Computer Center also yesterday, where uh, he was analyzing one paper uh, where he saw that, uh, at least related to machine learning, there was, I mean, only half of the articles sharing software, uh, a bit better than some kind of uh, uh, evaluation, et cetera, but we're still far from having this as common uh, standards. And in fact, the answer is not obvious why this is not happening. I mean, as I've said, it asks for substantial effort that sometimes is not really recognized. And, and in fact, there is this relation, this complicated relation between technology transfer uh, versus scientific def um, dissemination. Even yesterday, I was having a chat with the CEO of a company that we are involved in, and, and he was telling me that, look, the UPF needs to decide if you go for technology transfer or you go for scientific dissemination and publishing papers. I mean, I don't have this vision of black and white, but it still is something that it needs to be taken into account. If you are publishing things, uh, and then you are revealing some uh, secrets that may be interested for the company, just not to be public. So this is not tricky. But anyway, I'm still convinced it's worth it, and let me show you some examples uh, on this that I've uh, been working on during uh, the last few years in terms of integrative projects, multidisciplinary, and with uh, open science research. So already in, in my PhD, um, the, the, the framework of my PhD was an industrial doctorate. So I was uh, collaborating and funded by a small company, Segami, uh, that was really, really interesting just uh, from the very beginning of my career to see the difference between the constraints and the interests of a small company versus what we were doing at the university. I mean, it was really different, and, and we needed to balance uh, the different constraints. Uh, my PhD, I work on, on uh, medical image segmentation and registration of different organs of the thorax. Uh, we set up a hierarchical framework when we were uh, segmenting gradually and in a hierarchical way different structures in multimodal images, in CT, computer tomography images, where you can see nice the structure of the heart and uh, nuclear medicine when you see the function. Uh, so that was good. Uh, and, and I mean, my PhD supervisor, uh, Professor Isabel Blog, is a lovely person, uh, but sometimes I was feeling a bit alone in, in during the PhD. Uh, and in fact, uh, a very good friend during the PhD at the same time, Olivier Collio, had the same situation. So we started to 
uh, work together. And he was working on neuroimage. So we really, by talking together uh, in different kind of applications, we ended up doing or reusing or adapting the codes from one uh, to another. And, and with the same strategy, we were segmenting different structures of uh, brain uh, images. Uh, so that was quite, quite interesting. And how with this, uh, with this kind of knowledge of different applications, you can really readapt your methodologies. Then, as Miguel Angel was saying, I moved to, to, to London for a postdoc. And it's not like it was really my choice to, to start working fully on neuroimaging. It was the only offer I have uh, for a postdoc. So either this or work in McDonald's. So, I mean, uh, I needed money there in London. It was very expensive, so I started. I was super lucky to end up in a very nice project. And then I met neurologists, uh, and this is another species of animals, huh? I mean, comparing to other medical disciplines. And so I needed to learn, again, new topics. In this case, uh, we work on the simulation of the effect of Alzheimer's disease in brain structures for the validation of, of some image processing tools. So that was super interesting. And then I came to, to UPF, and also I, I met uh, all sorts of different animals that I haven't met before. I mean, supervisors that were basically micromanagers, and, and also a lot of developers, uh, software developers, and a lot of managers. I mean, we were in the group, in system, we were a lot of people, and there were around 10 managers, around 10 developers, all of them with different uh, languages, different ways to work, different constraints, etc. And in fact, I was involved from the very beginning in a large European project um, where uh, we were given almost 20 million uh, euros for four years uh, with a lot of really large hospitals in, in Europe um, and good research uh, institutes and groups, small companies, big companies. So really a very good environment. The, the objective was to develop computational models of the heart uh, to being used in the clinic uh, and, and to affect medical decisions. So what had happened is that after four years and almost 20 million euros, engineers, we were very happy. Uh, we made a lot of progress in computational techniques, but the clinicians of the project, when they saw that we have applied all our tools in only two patients uh, after four years and 20 million euros, or even some months later on eight patients, they were not very happy on their side. It was like, come on guys, I, I cannot use this effectively in, in, in my clinical routine if you have tried only in two cases. And this again, it was showing the difference uh, and the difficulties of working um, between engineers and clinicians. The timings are different, the needs are different. Um, also in parallel, I, I was involved during those years on setting up uh, one of these challenge. This was one of the first ones on biophysical models in at Mikai. And, and in fact, uh, in the end, well, the idea was to, to um, develop uh, electrophysiological models of the heart to predict the response of a heart uh, on some therapies or on some, uh, pa uh, or some patient. And in fact, there were four groups uh, uh, kind of fighting to, to be the best one uh, from people in France, Maxime, or Pablo Lamata in Oxford on the US Lingway. And I mean, it was quite interesting, this fight. Uh, but the most interesting thing, uh, this fight is quite typical in biophysical models. Uh, people or, or researchers that work on very detailed models that are very uh, uh, costly computationally with thousands of equations and parameters and others that work more on phenomenological models, uh, uh, not that mechanistic. Uh, the interesting thing is that after some fight, what we did was really to work together and trying to combine uh, the advantages of every type of model. And, and in the end, well, I'm not going to enter into detail, but we obtained better results by the combination of uh, detailed models with phenomenological models that rather just individually. So that was uh, very nice. Um, also, uh, in 2011, there was kind of an earthquake. Uh, and then uh, we created, I mean, from the ashes of Sistip, we created uh, Fisens, we created, there were 
quite a lot of changes. We created a couple of research groups, uh, and the, the one I was involved, it was Fisons. Uh, out of the funders, I, I'm the only one remaining fully uh, uh, at the TIG UPF, I mean, for different reasons. Uh, right now, we are kind of these uh, people with a lot of PhD students, postdocs, some developers, and, uh, and some help from the Barcelona uh, MedTech unit. Um, so really, obviously, the, the leitmotif of Fisens is related to what I have explained you before. It's just really on the clinical translation of these methodological uh, tools, filling the gap between engineers and clinicians. Uh, all in multidisciplinary projects and integrating the technological part with uh, the science uh, basics and in, in particular clinical applications. As Miguel Angel said, uh, we are part of the Barcelona MedTech unit that really um, most groups are uh, working in interdisciplinary projects in a lot of different fields in biomedical engineering. Uh, so these are kind of four divisions of, of different computational tools that, and projects we work on uh, in Fisens. I'm going to give you some uh, uh, snapshots of, of every one of them. Like in terms of analysis of cardiac images and signals, um, I mean recently, just a couple of days ago, we had accepted one paper already from the PhD of Marta Nunez. But what we tried to do was to develop uh, common reference systems um, to integrate uh, multimodal data, in this case from the atria. The, the atria is a particular structure in the heart, quite important for some arrhythmias like atrial fibrillation. And in the current uh, structures uh, and data you have, uh, it's not obvious to, to uh, compare and to integrate this data. So what we did was to come up with uh, uh, homeomorphic transformation to transform the 3D object to this kind of disks, 2D disks that the clinicians like a lot because in one shot without rotating the 3D structure, you can visualize everything. And then we use this framework to integrate their uh, multiple data from the same patient at different time points or from different patients. And in fact, now that has been accepted on this uh, uh, IEEE uh, journal, uh, we are working on getting the graphics uh, rep replicability stamp. There is a really nice initiative uh, in some, well, in the field of, of computer graphics. It's a stamp saying that, okay, you have done something, but it's really reproducible. And so that's very, very interesting, uh, and it would be nice for other fields to, to adopt this, um, this kind of uh, awards or, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, before, um, before Marta, uh, there was another PhD, David Soto, that was working on similar topics but on the ventricle. And again, we were trying to get the 3D structure and to flatten this into a 2D disk for the same purposes or integrating different multimodal information. And, and in fact, this was related to really interesting experiments that we were doing at some point in the hospital clinic. These are some pigs that were there. And uh, it, it was a project promoted by Bart and, and other people uh, where we were having the pigs and we were acquiring uh, a lot of uh, data uh, structural and functional data of the uh, electrical and mechanical part of the heart, then we were inducing an electrical problem, an ablation, um, a left bundle branch block uh, anormality, measuring again everything, and then imp uh, implanting a kind of pacemaker to see how it was recovered. And this was huge data. There was around 30 peaks with infarct, 30 peaks without in, infarct. The experiments were quite interesting. And um, I mean, you had here an electrophysiologist taking data with a catheter inside. You had uh, people, um, imaging people, well, clinicians doing echo images. Here, there is Gemma, super scared, Gemma Piella, super scared, because at some point the pig was jumping. Uh, uh, and there was the vets here. So it's huge data that if you don't have good visual analytics and tools for visualization and, and understanding, it's quite complex. So we use these flattening maps to really generate visualizations where you could see all the data together. Here in this disk, we can see this is the left ventricle heart uh, at baseline with the peak healthy. Uh, this is after uh, 
the electrical abnormality, and this is with the device implanted. In particular, in the two ventricles, you can see here, the colors are more homogeneous. It means that the electrical activation is synchronous in the two ventricles, and this is good. We want this to be synchronous and exert the force to uh, uh, pump blood. When you have the electrical abnormality, you see these differences in colors. It means that the right ventricle is activated early, and this is really bad. And how with the therapy, you can compensate a bit this, uh, this anomaly. So we had different representations, uh, and we could quantify all these uh, phenomena with this uh, type of tools. So, and, and this really leads me to uh, the validation of some of the biophysical models with uh, data. And in fact, from the very beginning, we were uh, working with uh, engineers in uh, Siemens Health in, in Princeton, the US, because they wanted this data to validate the realism of the biophysical models they were using and they were developing uh, to improve therapies. So that was uh, very interesting because a company was really using our data for their products. And in fact, this was the, the, the beginning or, or uh, the beginning of the idea, okay, but let's try to organize a challenge based on this data. Uh, and this was the inception of the CRT EPG uh, workshop or, or challenge they organized last year at Mikai. All fit very well because it was the Chinese year of the peak in 2019. The, the conference was in China also, so I mean, for sure I needed to organize this. Um, and in fact, it asked for a lot of work and coordination. All these people were involved in the organization of the challenge from the data collectors and, and curation, uh, people processing data. Uh, it was quite intensive uh, to organize the challenge and the deadlines, etc. And And in the end, uh, it, well, it was interesting uh, in, during Mikai, because over the time of the challenge, we realized that being a challenge, there were a lot of uh, research groups that they didn't want to participate because they didn't want not to be the first ones uh, because of the time and limitations also. So we changed this rather than a challenge. Uh, it was a working group. And then more research groups came. We said, we are not going to have a ranking. And then rather than that, we are going to be collaborative and to share our results. And that was very, very interesting. And, and in fact, this data is quite unique. Uh, no one has this. Um, and, and also it was interesting because Mikai nowadays is just fully devoted to AI and machine learning. And, and it was interesting to see if we could uh, be there in this conference being a non-AI uh, challenge and in fact we were highlighted in the main session of the of the challenges as hey guys there is one non machine learning based challenge uh, and they are collaborative that was interesting I, I wrote kind of a paper uh, uh, with the lessons taken out of this and in fact some are, are here like something we really realized that don't blindly believe in the ground truth data because you need to take into account uncertainty. Or these metrics, these metrics like the dyes in segmentation, you need to be very careful. And also believe in open science and collaborative uh, works. Um, also, I mean, uh, I said already this, I mean, we were having a lot of questions if this was really worthy or not. In the end it was, but it had a cost. Um, um, so related to other uh, works on biomedic or on biophysical models, there was the PhD in collaboration with Philips out of the ITN um, Marie Curie uh, uh, training doctorate during the last four years led by Bart and, and by, by Mathieu de Gran. And, and in fact, uh, the PhD of Eric Yuk, uh, he developed uh, an electromechanical model of the heart with meshless techniques, not based on finite elements. And it was very interesting uh, because until this point, no one has tried really meshless techniques on this. Uh, I mean, Olaf is here because, I mean, simulations was using frozen, like SPH simulations to, to simulate the snow and all this. Um, the good thing is was uh, in Oakland, while I was there, I mean, Eric came for three months and we worked together with researchers, local researchers there because they had very good uh, experimental data of dogs, very rich. So we adapted the model uh, to fit the data of uh, the dog. And this helped a lot to make 
the, the realism, to make uh, the models more uh, realistic. And Philips are very happy with this tool nowadays and a lot of people are using it now. Uh, also in terms of modeling, there was also the PhD of Ruben Doste finish end of last year. The, he was working more on the electrical part of the heart. Um, the idea was to simulate ECGs, electrocardiograms, when you have certain uh, ectopic fossa abnormal, uh, abnormal electrical stimulus in different parts of the heart. So the idea was with biophysical models, try to identify where was the region where you had this uh, electrical abnormality. Then give this to the clinician so that they can guide the intervention. Well, um, the, yeah, the, the intervention can be guided. Uh, for doing this, we needed to develop uh, mathematical models uh, to represent the myocardial uh, fiber orientation because this is something you cannot measure with images. So we need to come up with uh, some models because it's crucial to have realistic uh, electrical activation and mechanics of the heart. So it's based on Laplace equations, setting up some coordinate systems, um, and then we end up with um, all these vectors that is the preferential direction of the electrical conduction in, in the heart. Without this being realistic, it's impossible to get the electrocardiograms in the torso properly uh, simulated. Uh, so the good thing is that Ruben uh, created this code to generate these fibers. Uh, it's not yet open source, but we are distributing to everyone, basically. And there is a lot of people that are using it, including Philips, including people at the Barcelona Supercomputer Center, King's College, etc. So this is quite, quite interesting that is useful. It's really useful for people outside uh, the PhD of Ruben. Um, just some of the results, uh, very interestingly, we managed to have uh, prediction accuracies of the location of the abnormal electrical focus uh, in more than 90% of the cases. Uh, we are working to process more data, but having some simulations that are realistic enough, it allows us to generate large virtual populations. Uh, and if you generate hundreds of virtual simulations, then you can uh, start um, integrating uh, all these biophysical modeling uh, results and analyze them with machine learning tools. Um, like the ones developed here at UPF by Gemma, Bard, uh, uh, Miguel Angel, etc. This multiple kernel learning that is kind of a God's tool because it's used for everything uh, in our labs. Um, and it's very interesting because this combination of real data with virtual simulations is really the trend in a lot of different applications. Uh, because quite often, the data you can acquire is not enough to train the machine learning algorithms. You need, uh, and these simulations can really provide you the large numbers you need for training of these algorithms. But you need the data also, because you need to have also the particular noise of the data. So I'm seeing more and more uh, projects where this combination between simulation results and data are the ones used or let's say high quality and low quality annotations. These are the ones that are being used nowadays in machine learning training. Talking about machine learning, um, my first serious contact was in 2011 uh, after one talk given by Anders Johnson on the automatic action planning and all reinforcement learning techniques and, and in the group of Hector Hefner. And, and I really made a link with decision trees because decision trees is kind of some of the representations used uh, in clinical medicine for, uh, to represent the clinical recommendations. So uh, we were talking, say, hey, let's see if we can create uh, clinical recommendations automatically with these machine learning tools from the data. And this was the framework of the PhD of Cecilia Nunes that also finished end of last year. And also within uh, first the VP2HF European project and then through Carter Function. And it was very interesting how some, in some applications, the, the decision tree generated by the algorithm to represent better the data, the data and having better accuracies was quite different from the official clinical guidelines. So the study of why these two are different is very, very interesting. And in fact, 
Cecilia did a lot of work to add, to improve DT learning by adding, uh, uh, uncertainty. to take into account you have uncertainty in the data, and now we are applying this to other clinical problems where it's helping a lot to better understand the data uh, that we have, because these tools are interpretable. Uh, and this is a key uh, topic these days in machine learning. Machine learning uh, has been used a lot during the last five years in medical uh, applications. And, and we recently worked with uh, Emilia and other people through, I mean, within the human int uh, uh, framework to uh, have a white paper uh, trying to see the different steps of clinical decision making and the use of machine learning. And, and in fact, you can see uh, in the literature that there has been a lot of works on data acquisition and feature extraction, and that's okay. You can do this more or less with black boxes, but when you go towards interpretation and decision support, uh, black box uh, techniques cannot really be used. I mean, there is a higher risk for patients on using black box techniques here. We have people working on this kind of feature extraction with deep learning, like the PhD of Guillermo, trying to adapt classical uh, network architectures like UNET to work on signals, on 1D signals like ECGs, like electrocardiograms. And to be honest, it's more complex to work uh, on machine learning with uh, signals than images, uh, and that's quite interesting also. We are having interesting results already as part of one uh, kind of European project with Kiron and Galgo uh, companies to really integrate the output of this uh, signal uh, processing with uh, imaging data, again, for guiding uh, some interventions in arrhythmia patients. Also, uh, we are working um, with another large data base created in the UK, the UK Biobank, that they have thousands of cases of MR images of volunteers. And to deal with thousands of cases is not obvious. And most of people uh, also uh, use these kind of black box um, techniques. So we were trying to adapt, uh, together with Karim and Miguel Angel, to adapt some techniques like radiomics that extract hundreds of features and then fit this to classification algorithms to really have features that are more interpretable for the clinician. So this is quite challenged because the data is in balance and the reproducibility of the features is not obvious. Um, this slide uh, on machine learning, uh, I'm putting uh, in several talks that I've been invited in the last year uh, to explain machine learning to clinicians, that they want to know what it is. And, and this is quite important because what they hear in the news is that AI is going to replace them. Uh, and obviously this is not true. And, and this interpretability, this is very, very important. Um, and we need to be careful with black boxes. And also the availability and generalization of the databases is not the same to work with curated databases from challenges, etc., than with real world uh, data. Uh, also, like AI is not only in this uh, deep learning, and and very important point is this clinical data curation and management. Uh, one of the main problems is the clinicians comes to you and say, "I have the best data worldwide. It's unique," and then you start going there and checking, and it's not organized at all. It's not standardized. It's not harmonized. Uh, there is a lot of missing data, so it's a nightmare. And but. They cannot do this. They don't have the resources to do this in their hospitals. They need biomedical engineers. And, and this is something that is not very common in, in the clinical units, to have biomedical engineers to help them creating the data and, and, and helping. And without this, this is impossible to work on machine learning in biomedical applications. That's why most people working at the methodologies of, of machine learning techniques, they don't work with medical data, just with CATs and, and all these things. And also, it's quite tricky uh, to have a system where it's secure, remote, and shareable uh, between different sites. So during the last years, we have developed the Rocket uh, platform uh, that tries to uh, provide solutions to some of these problems. And this has been in the context of the Maria de Maestro also. And it's kind of a, an environment uh, where uh, the, with the main driver has been Carlos Jagüe where we can connect to different uh, type of databases, we can connect to, to the cloud, we can 
uh, we have all the infrastructure to dockerize uh, algorithms and, and to set up pipelines for this. And also very importantly, we have tools, web-based, so it can be easily shared, no problems for installation, uh, to develop tailor uh, a specific, uh, or um, let's say, um, tailor application uh, web-based interfaces for a given problem. And here there are uh, some of them. I'm not sure if it's working. Should be working. This video, no? Sorry. Let's see the mouse. Well, this is one of the interfaces. Ah, no, sorry. There is no video. So this is one of the interfaces we have to visualize all the data of uh, study. So clinician can check all the patient available from, uh, uh, from this patient, uh, the, the visit times, and, and you can visualize in the browser all these different data. You can do queries, uh, etc. Also, we adapted this platform to very interesting projects. Um, um, this was uh, a project funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation where we were uh, taking um, images, uh, echocardiography images acquired in Pakistan in some rural areas where there is uh, high mortality in, in babies during pregnancy because in breathing, etc. And uh, we developed the whole uh, uh, infrastructure to have this data uh, securely uh, ported to some servers and then being visualized with nice web-based interfaces by clinicians in the US in order to give recommendations back to the local people in Pakistan. But for this, you needed a lot of infrastructure effort. Also, we are adapting uh, this tool in a project now with the World Health Organization that is really related to visual analytics and, and we are visualizing the results of some machine learning algorithms like these two lines it just they are defined the range of normality of a given uh, parameter. And then uh, if you have data from every patient, longitudinal data from every patient like this in pink, you can see if um, these values are in the range of normality or outside and then it's kind of interesting to set up an alarm. So finally, in terms of hard brain uh, applications, I mean, in 2015, uh, I was thinking, okay, let, let's try to, to apply for an ERC. I mean, a lot of people uh, has an ERC in the department, so it, it cannot be that difficult, right? Uh, so the, the thing is that uh, in the brainstorming, um, uh, well, we saw that uh, I've been working in the heart and in the brain, so it was a good idea to try to come up with ideas linking the two uh, organs in a holistic way. And, and the first idea was to work with uh, all uh, people from uh, data from all people and the relation between a stroke and atrial fibrillation. And the second idea was to work with infant data or, or fetal data uh, to analyze the cardiovascular abnormalities or the effect of cardiovascular abnormalities in brain development. So for the first one, um, this relation between a stroke and atrial fibrillation is well known. And, and in fact, uh, something very interesting is that uh, almost 100% of the thrombus created in, in the heart, in the left atria, are generated in a particular structure called uh, left atrial appendage. And this is why, uh, because uh, it's a structure where you have low velocities and, and you have complex flow. And, and in fact, this structure, uh, this left atrial appendage structure is quite interesting because no one knows why it's there, why evolution left is there. Um, and it's very interesting to uh, study morphology because all of us have different morphology of this structure, where well, there are certain categories, and hemodynamics, blood flow. And in fact, clinicians came up with this kind of uh, category or morphological category where if you have this shape, you have a cactus. If you have this, you have chicken wing, a windsock of a, or a cauliflower. I have a chicken wing uh, and I'm happy because uh, the chicken wing uh, morphology is related to a lower risk of having thrombus. Why? Well, no one knows for sure, uh, but in theory, it should be related to the shape uh, that you have. That with this shape, apparently, you have uh, a less risk uh, of having uh, low velocities and complex flows. 
So uh, these are some uh, of the impatience. In this type of patients, they give anticoagulants like the Cintron, but if it doesn't work or they have contraindications, uh, they have one of these devices implanted, the left appendage occluder device. So when I saw this, uh, to me, it reminded me uh, some project I was involved in SysTip on cerebral aneurysms. And really, it was really the same computational tools needed. Work on the uh, morphology and work on the hemodynamics with computational tools. That's why I uh, wrote this project, Compilau project, uh, to really do this. Work on left atrial appendages on the 3D morphology and the blood flow. So these are some of the uh, recon 3D reconstructions of this uh, of these left atrial appendages. We did some um, morphology, simple morphological characterization, uh, finding automatically the center lines, etc. Uh, and one postdoc uh, of our lab, Andy, um, he uh, created a pipeline to generate automatic, well, not automatically, sorry, to generate uh, finite element meshes from the medical data using open source softwares, all of them. In fact, these softwares, we are teaching them to uh, the undergraduate uh, uh, students these days. And in fact, uh, in the, within the PhD of, um, of Jordi, uh, we created this uh, video uh, that shows some of the outputs of these simulations. And this is a collaboration with Hospital Clinic Hospital Sao Paulo, where it was very interesting in this case, this is the device implanted, where with the configuration the device was implanted, we had some regions with low flow and uh, complex flow. So with high risk of thrombus. And in fact, this patient, after the implantation of the device, he had thrombus. And we predicted the region where the thrombus was. Uh, and that was uh, quite good to assess the realism of the simulations. And in fact, Jordi uh, virtually placed the device in another position to see that in this optimal position, you, sh uh, you would have avoided uh, thrombus generation in this case. Okay? So we are now uh, in a project uh, where we are going to run this in a lot of cases uh, at the Mare Nostrum. Uh, we have also uh, developed uh, a pipeline uh, on this and an interface called VIDA, uh, where basically we provide all these tools to the clinician. And in fact, this is a kind of promotional video that we uh, did within the framework of Ayabo project. So it's a bit of blah, 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 the clinician saying, oh, these people are helping us a lot and, and all this uh, bullshit. Uh, and then uh, let me pass. And then this is the interface where the clinicians can visualize the medical images with the 3D reconstruction of the structure, but also together with the device. And in fact, the, the user can select different devices before the intervention to have a better idea on which is the optimal device to be implanted. Uh, clinicians like this a lot. Uh, and in fact, um, also we have this kind of center line tools uh, that also they're in love with. And in fact, they are starting to use uh, and also the simulations, even if now are offline. And in fact, they are starting to use these tools as demos in some uh, conferences, some clinical conference, and even uh, within live cases. So in some of these conferences, they do live cases, and they are using this tool to better uh, understand the, 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 the anatomy before the intervention. I will pass this kind of uh, part. Um, so after Compilau, I created VidoLive, that this is kind of the next uh, Retos project, or, or I mean, it has already started, where I tried to add more uh, fancy keywords like virtual reality, augmented reality, uh, machine learning, and all this. The only thing missing is blockchain, but I will put it. Um, and in fact, we have interesting results uh, now in collaboration with uh, some uh, different international centers. And in the PhD of Xavier Morales, we have combined uh, kind of deep learning with, this, um, with these tools in order to try to uh, have a deep learning based surrogate of these uh, simulations. But why? Because these simulations take hours and in this deep learning base is almost real time. And in fact, we are having very, very nice results uh, saying that with deep learning, we can already 
have this kind of predictions of risk of problems in these cases. Also, other collaborations with other uh, international groups uh, to really have a model, a fully coupled model between the brain and the heart, and, and also some of the first uh, virtual reality uh, versions of VIDA uh, that is starting to, to work well and also working on other data like 4D flow data with Valley Brown and General Electric. Uh, okay. And what about the second idea? The second idea was to work with babies, and in fact it's on intrauterine growth restriction babies, that they have insufficiencies uh, during fetal life because of placenta problems, uh, getting less oxygen and, and nutrients to the brain. And in fact, we know that there is a remodeling, uh, vascular remodeling, and there are differences in the brain. So the idea was to really uh, show this relation between the cardiac and the brain in these babies. And in fact, I applied. Uh, the first thing was to decide to which panel. That was a nightmare to decide, it wasn't obvious. So the first phase, I passed the first phase, I, I went to Brussels, but in the second phase, they pissed on me. Uh, they really, I mean, didn't like it uh, there in the interview. Uh, but I could, uh, I could apply uh, in 2016, but well, I failed again. So it's okay. I mean, the thing is that uh, I'm a bit stubborn, and after all this, I waited a bit of time, but I set up in the end a really nice international network um, uh, to work on, on this particular topic. And in fact, the PhD of Mireya Aleña that has started uh, quite recently, she's going to work fully on this. And we have already uh, very interesting first results uh, of modeling, uh, I mean, with using code from these collaborators, uh, trying to model the evolution of the brain from a, a very s a smooth brain and 20 weeks, weeks of gestational age to really uh, a fully developed um, uh, brain that we need to improve to be more realistic. And in collaboration with Oakland, we'll start adding, um, adding uh, vasculature uh, to really see this relation with the cardiovascular problem. So we are doing a lot of other things beyond this, uh, not necessarily cardiac or, or, um, or, or neurological, uh, like this me window. And this me window was quite interesting. We have developed this catheter to measure the electric properties of the tissue, and that is helping really to um, uh, distinguish between different pieces of tissue in colonoscopies, between healthy tissue and different type of malignant tissue. Um, so it has been proved with ex vivo, uh, ex vivo experiments. And in fact, we created this company, Miwendo, because we were having a lot of uh, funding uh, from uh, technology transfer. And things are going well. But I mean, we need this balance between scientific dissemination and, and technology transfer. Uh, just to finish, integration is also possible and needed, not just in research, but also in the different hats we have here as permanence in terms of teaching and management. And in fact, I've been really trying to do this uh, in, man in teaching by bringing uh, our students closer to our research. And this is uh, an example, the, the subject of medical devices, where really most of the projects they need to do during the whole trimester are related to our research. And it's, they are very motivated, they win awards for undergraduates, we are having even pu journal publications out of their work. And also, I mean, I'm getting ooh, super fancy awards of teaching innovation because of this. Um, also in terms of management, I've been really involved in kind of multidisciplinary management. And that's within the framework of the biomedical engineering degree. There is an adventure between sex and us. And we have different priorities, different ways of working, different philosophies. And it was quite a fight at the beginning, but the degree is quite su successful, so in the end we, we managed, right? And also other initiatives saying really that to work together with companies, clinicians, uh, et cetera. So conclusions. So to me, it has been worthy to really work in integrative projects, multidisciplinary, and in open science, but it's not for everyone. I mean, it has certain costs, and, and I think that a specialization focus and, and technology transfer is as positive as the other alternatives. And we need people doing different things. We don't need everyone doing the same thing. 
I would just say, just try to have fun and try to have work on things that motivate you enough. But don't be afraid of getting out of your comfort zone. Quite often, it is quite uh, nice. So I just finish with uh, wishing you my best wishes for this new year, 2020, uh, full of good research and teaching and management and integration or differentiation, openness or closeness, depending on your priorities. And just to continue making the DTIC and UPF a nice place to be, even for biomedical engineers, even if sometimes it's not really easy. Thank you very much. So just acknowledgement, just I'm being really integrated into a feminine environment at home. And these two guys has been always very important here at home. Uh, my second home, or first one sometimes. And also all the people working in these super nice uh, labs. Thank you very much. Any questions? <laughs> Anybody? Yes? Thank you, Oscar, for is, it, is this working? Yeah. Thanks for, for, for the for the nice talk. Um there were at some point I was screening through some of the tables which I could barely read. But at some point I saw some uh, kind of success rates of around 90% that you mentioned at some point. Um, the first question is what are these success rates referring to exactly? And then if these are high enough? That, that's very important. Again, it's something quite generic. It's the definition of the metric, your accuracy metrics. You can trick everything. I mean, you no, can I'm choose. I'm not asking for a trick. I'm just no, 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 but, but, but it's very important. I mean. It's quite, quite uh, sometimes the metric is not the most appropriate one uh, to define the, uh, well, you need several metrics to have a, a full overview of what you are doing. And, uh, and this is just, well, by you have 11 patients, you know, because the clinicians uh, found with data that the electrical problem was in this place and our algorithm uh, in 10 out of these 11 cases, predicted the same place. Okay, so it's kind of, okay. Obviously, in 10 cases, this is not enough at all. I mean, this is just a very preliminary proof of concept, and we need to, to uh, get more cases to really see if this is reproducible or not, and the difficulties, I mean, for sure. And, and out of these challenges, it's very interesting how um, they, they are, they, they are starting to really say, okay, we need to combine different metrics. Only one is not going to give you a full picture of what's going on. Uh, computational times also, uh, and reproducibility, and all these things are important also, not just the given accuracy. In the, the, just to put things in, in, in the context of why I asked this question, is, as you know, in the area I work on, we work with error rates that are far lower than 10 percent, so you know, 10 to the minus 6. So that's why a 10 percent uh, error rate seems like on the high end of the spectrum. But in particular, because we are dealing with patient data. Yeah, I, uh, I mean, this one guy can die. Yeah. Uh, so it's really tricky. But uh, medical data is very noisy, and variability uh, between different people is very high. So if I see something, uh, some algorithm working on medical data that gives some values beyond 95%, I won't believe it at all. Because, I mean, this is not medicine. This is not medicine. You need to account at least for at least 5% uh, of uh, inaccuracies due to data acquisition issues not having good enough and high quality data. In the end, you are extracting some data from the patient that has a lot of noise. And also, the, the, it's impossible to get a full picture of a person. You don't have the genetics, you don't have the family history for everyone. It's just too complex. It's almost likely the same algorithm run on a different set, essentially, would predict a totally different number. 
well, that's what we need to work with uh, in really finding the type of data you can process with the same algorithms. It's not like you have uh, a hammer and you can use it for everything. And, and, and that's tricky. And, and sometimes one of the main failures in medicine is that you treat patients that are different in the same way. Uh, because you have some indices that are similar, but they are not giving you the full picture. And this is why a lot of therapies are failing. Because you are treating heart failure patients, like heart failure, but heart failure can mean whatever. Other questions? Okay, let me ask one, even though I <laughs> see you every day. Um, so you, you mentioned at the beginning as motivation of the talk, particularly, yeah, this, this idea of integration of uh, data and models. Right? And, and you were saying now that, you know, patients are all different and it's very difficult to have complete data. Um, so, so I want to, to, I want to ask your opinion, yeah, because of course there is now this big push now for, uh, machine learning, deep learning, everything seems to be now doable by having enough data to train your model. Um, but I guess in medicine, well, I guess I know, in medicine is, is not the case. I mean, you, you cannot have complete data about patients. So where, where do you see this going? I mean, of course, now people are a bit running back and forth and trying things, and you go to conferences and you see people saying that with deep learning you can basically diagnose anything. Um, and then people saying, no, 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 this is bullshit, yeah? And then keeping to their models and not talking to each other, yeah? But of course, there are a lot of integrative efforts. Mm. So where, where do you see this converging? So well, I mean, there is a lot of very smart people uh, working on deep learning uh, and trying to better understand how it works, uh, whitening the black boxes. Uh, at the same time, there are a lot of people that they are just running these things without having any low knowledge on the application. And as I've said, for certain tasks, it's okay. Uh, just to detect something in an image like feature extraction, you can work with black boxes. It's just more, more towards the interpretation uh, and, I mean, giving recommendations for, uh, for the clinical decisions that this is more risky. So there are a lot of people working on this kind of the interpretability and improve the interpretability uh, of the machine learning techniques that is going to help a lot. And, and in terms of the data, I mean, y y it's like Google can have very easily millions of images of cats, and that's okay. Then you have a very good uh, and large uh, data for training. And, and in some medical applications, like getting pictures of the skin for skin cancer detection, you can easily get also millions of images. But when you work with the heart, you cannot have one million cases. And, and the variability is very high, as I've said, uh, between different people. So we need to be conscious that uh, data is not going to solve everything uh, in these cases. And also, data means annotated data with someone that has been a slave for one or two years uh, putting the annotations manually. Obviously, there is a, the trend is going to unsupervised machine learning techniques, uh, trying to develop these cycle guns for, uh, for data augmentation. This is going to help also. But we cannot trust just the data or, 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 be, or say, okay, just it's a matter of time that will get enough data and this will solve every problem. That, that's not going to happen at all. And then there is the validation. Huh? All this needs to va be validated in a clinical environment with real world data, with randomized clinical trials, and this hasn't happened yet. And this is going to take five, 10 years, if not more. Okay, last chance. Okay, then uh, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.